So let us continue with the congenital anomalies of the gastrointestinal tract. So let's start with your esophageal atresia. So this is the mechanism or the pathogenesis behind your esophageal atresia. So there is a thin non-canalized cord which replaces a segment of the esophagus, most commonly located near or at the tracheal bifurcation. Esophageal atresia is usually associated with your TEF or your tracheoesophageal fistula. So esophageal atresia is usually associated with tracheal esophageal fistula. So here, this is an example of how esophageal atresia is associated with tracheoesophageal fistula. Now, diaphragmatic hernia. So before anything else, let's mention some basic anatomy. So always remember the septum transversal gives rise to the central tendon of the diaphragm, while the pleural peritoneal membrane gives rise to the muscular part of the diaphragm. So let's recap. The septum transversal, this is the embryologic origin of the diaphragm, gives rise to the central tendon of the diaphragm. The pleuroperitoneal membrane gives rise to the muscular part of the diaphragm. So whenever you have incomplete formation or development of the diaphragm, you're going to encounter diaphragmatic hernia, wherein the abdominal viscera will herniate into the thoracic cavity. Now, what is the problem when you have displaced viscera? This can cause pulmonary hypoplasia, which is incompatible with life. So this is the embryologic origin of the diaphragm. Okay, the two most important, septum transversum, gives rise to the central tendon of the diaphragm, pleuroperitoneal membrane. Now, please don't forget, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, okay, margadne, this is anterior. This is usually found on the right side. This is rare. Again, margadne is anterior congenital diaphragmatic hernia. It's found on the right side. It is rare. Bokdelek is posterior, okay, specifically posterior lateral. This is found on the left side, usually. Okay, so the most common congenital diaphragmatic hernia is Bokdelek. So Bokdelek is posterior. Most common location is posterior lateral. And it's usually posterior lateral on the left side. Morgadne is anterior, usually found on the right side. This is rare. Hope you got this. Now let's mention gastroschisis and omphalocele. So an omphalocele is described as the herniation of the abdominal viscera into a ventral membranous sac. I want everyone to remember 
there is a sack. Is that clear? This is the most important differentiation. So there is a sack. So when does an omphalocil occur? When there is closure, incomplete closure of the abdominal muscles. So incomplete closure of the abdominal muscles, incomplete closure of the abdominal muscles leads to an omphalocele. Now let's play around with your memory bank. I'm going to give you keywords. Macroglossia, so a large tongue. There's earlobe creases. There is an omphalocele. What is your diagnosis? Okay, what is the diagnosis? There's an infant with macroglossia, earlobe creases, and the presence of omphalocele. Okay, very good. This is Beckwith. Weidemann syndrome. Okay, back with Weidemann syndrome. Uh, usually there is midline abdominal defects. Okay, midline abdominal defects. This is back with Weidemann syndrome. So please take note of that. Now question, what are the two most common cancers associated with beckwith Weidemann? The two most common malignancies. Okay, the two most common malignancies associated with beckwith Weidemann. Okay, so one, okay, Wilms. Next is the liver. So since this is a child, okay, since this is a child, this would specifically be what cancers. So one is nephroblastoma. Okay, that's Wilms. Next is hepatoblastoma. So basically, it is going to be, again, basically, it's going to be liver and kidney. A liver and kidney. So I'm going to make a letter O okay, just to, vis to help you visualize. Let's make a very big letter O here. Look, letter O for omphalocele, it has a sac. Again, big letter O for omphalocele, it has a sac. Okay. I hope everyone got that. Now, what about gastroschisis, also known as laparoschisis? This is characterized as a congenital malformation of the abdominal wall, the ventral wall. As you can see, literally, if you look at the picture, the abdominal viscera are literally coming out. Okay, the abdominal viscera is literally coming out. Now, take note. This involves all layers of the abdominal wall. That means from the peritoneum to the skin. The defect is usually, the defect is usually at the right of the insertion of the umbilical cord. A gastroschisis is usually found on the right side.
I hope you got this. Now, always remember this pearl, that in gastroschisis, it involves all of the abdominal layers. Okay, it involves all of the abdominal layers. So here, if you look at these two cartoons, gastroschisis, there's no sac there, omphalocele, there's a sac. Gastroschisis is usually located on the right side near the insertion of the umbilical cord. So that would be two very important differences. Now let's wind up. Let's mention your Meckel's diverticulum. Okay, this results from failure of involution of the vitellin duct or persistence of the vitellin duct, which we also call the omphalomesenteric duct. Okay, now this vitellin duct will connect the lumen of the developing duct gut to the yolk sac. Okay, the vitellin duct will connect the lumen of the developing gut to the yolk sac. So the most common congenital GI anomaly, the most common congenital GI anomaly is your Meckel's diverticulum. So persistence of the vitellin duct. So the rule of twos, please take time to go over this. So we have the famous 2% of the population, two feet location from the ileocecal valve, two inches in length, two times more common in males. So males, letter M, okay, that's Meckel's, and symptomatic by the age of two. A rule of twos, 2% 2 of the population, two feet from the ileocecal valve, two inches in length, two times more common in m -m 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 males, m -m 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 meckles, and symptomatic by the age of two. Now, in addition to this rule of twos, take note there are two ectopic tissues. My version of the rule of twos is there's more twos than what most handouts mention. So two ectopic tissues, which is gastric and pancreatic. And please remember, the most common is gastric. Two complications, bleeding perforation. Other textbooks might add obstruction, but it's basically bleeding and perforation. Bleeding is the most common. And don't forget this rule of thumb. The most common cause of lower GI bleeding in children okay, is Meckel's, okay? Most common cause of lower GI bleeding in children is Meckel's diverticulum. So let's wrap up things. <clears throat> so here, this is a Meckel's diverticulum on the right. That's a gross picture. Then we have the microscopic finding on the lower left. So clinical features, it can be asymptomatic. It can present as bleeding, which is usually what the presentation is, volvulus or intussusception during the first two years of life. Now, differential diagnosis would be one, acute appendicitis, especially this is children and your age group is within two years old. So acute AP, and you might want to rule out conditions like mesenteric adenitis as other differentials. So let's mention hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. So hypertrophic pyloric stenosis usually presents within the first few weeks of life as projectile, and take note, I highlighted one word because for me, this is the giveaway, non 
bilus vomiting. It is non bilus vomiting because it's not at the level of the duodenum. If you are at the level of the duodenum, especially the second part of the duodenum, this is where the common bile duct will empty. And that's why you get bilus vomiting. So projectile, non bilus vomiting during the first few weeks of life. Okay. Now there's something very important here. Okay. This is the famous olive shaped abdominal mass. Okay. An olive shaped abdominal mass. Now, I'm going to introduce you to my friend. I have a friend named Popeye. Does everyone know who Popeye is? Okay, who's the, who's the girlfriend of Popeye? It's olive oil. So Popeye, look, Popeye, I, Popeye, Popeye Loric Stenosis. Okay, let me exaggerate a little. Popeye is Popeyloric stenosis. Sino yung girlfriend ni Popeye? Olive. So what is Popeyloric stenosis? It's the olive, the palpable olive. Okay. On physical exam. Now, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is associated with Turner syndrome. It's also associated with <clears throat> trisomy 18. Now, what is trisomy 18 again? <clears throat> 18 years old, election age. This is Edwards syndrome. So trisomy 18 is Edwards syndrome. Now, let's play around before we end because someone is stimulating my memory back. Okay. I heard Turner's syndrome. This is XO, trisomy. Okay, this is XO, Turner syndrome. This is associated with the web neck. Okay, short stature, uh, the widely spaced nipples. This is associated with coarctation, the aorta, and this is associated with your bilateral street ovaries, which leads to amenorrhea and infertility. Okay, so keywords for Turner's syndrome. So I hope everyone got this. And if you talk about the newborn, okay, don't forget, there's going to be lymph edema. Okay, there's going to be lymph edema. So XO, web neck, short stature, the widely spaced nipples, coarctation of the aorta, bilaterally streaked ovaries, associate, associated with amenorrhea and infertility, and there's congenital lymph edema. Okay, Let's just hang in there. This is the last one, Hirschsprung's disease. Okay, so this usually results when the normal migration of the neural crest cells is arrested prematurely or when the ganglion cells undergo premature death. Now, basic recap in anatomy. You have the myenteric plexus, which is also known as your hour box plexus. This is responsible for 
motility. Then there's the Meissner's plexus. Let's make letter S capital. So the Meissner's plexus is responsible for big capital S secretions. Okay, so M, myenteric is motility. Meissner's is secretions. So when you have the absence or the death of these plexus, this is associated with what we call the congenital megacolon. Okay, the congenital megacolon. This is your famous Hirschsprung's disease. Now question, I just wanna stimulate before we, stimulate your brains before we end this module. Can you give me two conditions in adults where you would encounter your megacolon? Okay, two conditions, two conditions. Okay, I see Chagas, very good. And of course, ulcerative colitis. Okay, Chagas disease. So what are the two conditions you would encounter a megacolon? So one is Chagas disease. Next is ulcerative colitis. Okay, ulcerative colitis. So what happens when these plexus are dead or these plexus, okay, undergo premature death, you're going to develop a megacolon, okay? Now, please remember this term, aganglionosis, okay? So what happens is the distal intestinal segment will lack both the Meissner's and your box plexus. That's why you hear the term aganglionic megacolon. So, some must knows in the boxes. So in the distal segment, okay, when the, at the ganglion cells are absent, it's gonna have a grossly normal or contracted appearance. However, when the proximal segment is involved, this is gonna undergo progressive dilatation. And this is the one which is associated with the megacolon. So the proximal segment undergoes progressive dilatation. And this becomes massively distended. So that's the term megacolon. Now, please don't forget, okay, just let's add this before we end. <clears throat> Since the plexus will be found in the submucosa, diagnosis, is a deep rectal biopsy, okay, deep rectal biopsy. Treatment, immediate, is colostomy. Definitive, is the pull-through procedure. Okay, so please take note of this. Okay, 
So this is how the mega colon looks like. That's the proximal segment. And the clinical aspects, that's failure to pass meconium within the first 24 to 48 hours of life. There's obstructive constipation and explosive passage of flatus and feces. Treatment, uh, this is what your pathology book mentions, surgical resection of the aganglionic segment and reanastomosis. But you have to pay attention to what our surgery books say, which is colostomy followed by your pull-through procedure, okay? So that ends our module on the congenital anomalies of the GI tract. This is from your blue and orange boxes of your Robbins and Cotran pathologic basis of disease. This is Dr. Toon signing off saying happy studying, God bless, and thank you.